Aloha, and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around the World. Today is a very important day. It's the one-year commemoration of the military junta overthrow of the Myanmar democratic elected government. And we're here today with Simon Villanis to be able to share with us really what's going on, why it should matter to all of us, and what we can do going forward. It really is about indigenous rights and resistance in Myanmar in a year of the people's movements against the military, but there's so much more. We really are looking at indigenous peoples in Burmese standing together in solidarity against a repressive regime as it continues to violate human rights of its own people. And people on the planet must remain committed to the dignity and democracy, challenging the military and complicit corporations still working against the people's will. Simon, thank you so much for joining us. I feel the here, Josh. Could you share with us what happened a year ago and why that's so important? Well, a year ago, the uh, Burmese military launched one of their sadly uh, periodic military coups. And they, um, they prevented the uh, newly elected parliament from meeting. And they put under arrest uh, the president, uh, the state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, and other elected officials and reinstated total military rule. You said another coup. Could you share with us maybe a little bit of the history of the human rights movement in Myanmar and what the people have been trying to accomplish against very difficult government circumstances? Sure, I mean, the, the first military coup happened in 1962. Um, and then you had a long period of, of military rule that um, was almost punctuated by the 1988 um, uh, uprising um, that brought Aung San Suu Kyi to prominence. And uh, she was placed under house arrest. Uh, the military held elections in 1990. Aung San Suu Kyi's party won those elections. And then the military refused to respect the results of the elections that they had actually conducted. And you saw um, almost, almost uh, you saw continued military rule all the way through to around 2010, 2012, when uh, the army started to liberalize a little bit. Um, and um, there were elections in 2015 where Aung San Suu Kyi's party once again won a majority of the seats in parliament, um, but under a constitution written by the military, which preserved them a lot of power. And um, so you had this brief period of sort of semi-democratic rule uh, with this sort of military civilian hybrid government from 2015 through to uh, February of 1st of uh, 2021. Yeah, and I re many of us remember that cutting our teeth on the democracy and human rights movement, 8888, the monks organizing, mm -hmm. and then Aung San Suu Kyi always in a Toyota or some other vehicle under arrest, if they could, if it wasn't even stationary, they'd try to arrest her there. And it seems like the movement has grown. Can you maybe share how the human rights movement has matured over those decades? Sure. I mean, I started getting involved uh, just over 30 years ago in the uh, early 1990s. And that was when we, um, we deliberately um, started using the strategy and tactics of the campaign against apartheid in South Africa. And what we did was we organized uh, at the grassroots level around the world to put direct pressure on companies that were supporting the military hunter, and also to press our own governments to put government sanctions on, uh, on, on the military hunter as well. And um, what we saw throughout the 90s was uh, increasing numbers of companies pulling out of Burma amid all this consumer pressure, shareholder pressure, and, uh, and pressure from, from governmental sanctions. And that was very successful in getting to a point in the uh, early, uh, in, in 2010, 2010 um, and 2012, that the military realized that they couldn't continue this way. And they basically um, negotiated a, a settlement with the US and the European Union whereby uh, sanctions were taken off Myanmar and they in turn um, 
uh, had a certain political liberalization, and which led to this sort of military civilian hybrid government um, around from around 2015 to, as I said, a year ago, February 1st, uh, 2021. Maybe you can share with us also, what are the new sanctions that have just been imposed? And why are those important? And what was the movement behind those? And then we'll we'll start looking at even some of the other actions where they even moved the capital and some of the other absurd things that this military junta has done to try to avoid accountability. Yeah, I mean, even before the military coup, um, you know, we are part of a campaign to um, to go after the military junta's business interests and uh, uh, and to and to go at get at the money that the military receives. From its business empire, and so what you've been seeing is since the um, since the uh, the military's um, genocide against the Rohingya that started in August of 2017, you know we've been successful in getting uh, the U.S. and the European Union uh, and Canada to uh, place increasing sanctions on military officers and leaders and also on military owned companies where the military gets a lot of the money it needs to pay for weapons. And but more importantly, these um, government sanctions have been under, underpinned by what I call our, our citizen sanctions, which is our, our use of our consumer power, our shareholder power, media and social media power to put pressure on specific companies, specific foreign companies like say Kirin, the Japanese beer giant um, to uh, end their business relationships with military-owned companies, and by doing so, you know, try to, you know, through through our through our consumer power and shareholder power to get the the Burmese military out of the economy. Yeah, maybe we could look at you know beverages from Pepsi all the way through. Uh, some of the other aspects from beer, as you mentioned, all the way up to gems. What have been some of the success examples of really citizen people power to hold them accountable and divert funds and make sure that they feel the pressure to do the right thing and what matters most for the human rights movement in Burma? Well, one of the big successes, which I think you probably remember, uh, was in 1997 when Pepsi uh, ended its, uh, its business partnership with a a noted military crony, Thayn Tan, uh, in Burma. Pepsi had a bottling plant in Burma, and it was this joint venture with this military crony. Uh, and we successfully got Pepsi to completely exit that, uh, that partnership and uh, effectively get out of the country. And that was, you know, a lot of it was due to student activism. Uh, you know, college campuses like Stanford and Harvard and others um, you know, blocked Pepsi from getting contracts with their, their dining services. Um, and, you know, I was, one of the things I worked on is I'm, I, I'm a shareholder organizer. And so I organized shareholders in Pepsi to file shareholder resolutions, again, pressing them to stop doing business with this military crony. So that was very successful. Um, I think also one of the you're th thinking of that I also talked to was, uh, was um, the Japanese beer giant Kirin. And uh, they um, were in a, a business partnership with a military holding company. Uh, they produced uh, Myanmar beer and Mandalay beer, two of the biggest beer brands in Burma. And this is actually, you know, this generated millions of dollars for the military. Um, but, you know, Kirin was very vulnerable to our pressure because Kirin, the same time as they were doing business with the military in Myanmar, they were also buying up craft brewers in Australia, the UK, and the US. And when they bought New Belgium beer, which has been, been a very socially responsible beer company, I loved, I loved, I loved New, New Belgium. But when they bought New Belgium, you know, um, that was that that really was um, helped ignite the the campaign against Kirin, particularly in the United States, uh, and. Uh, we were very successful in putting very public pressure on, on New Belgium not to sell out to Kirin. But even when they did, then we you know, added New Belgium and all these other craft beers around the world to the boycott list 
And this was very successful in getting Kirin one to stop paying dividends to their military partner. And then finally, after the coup, they decided to completely exit that venture. That's a great point. We're asking people to raise a glass for good and to stand up for human rights. And maybe you could share also most recently uh, large oil companies that have also been taking action based on people power presentations and, and putting public pressure. Yeah, I mean, this actually frankly staggered me last week when the two of the big, world's biggest oil companies, Chevron and Total, which um, operated the hugely profitable Yadana gas pipeline and gas field uh, in Myanmar, they decided to exit that venture. Uh, uh, this was huge. I mean, I, 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 I still barely believe that these companies have decided to withdraw, but they, they, they have indeed. And again, this was due to all of the citizens' pressure being put on them. With um, they were there were shareholders that were putting pressure on on Chevron and Total, which I was helping to organize. Um, there, are, there's a whole uh, new uh, blood money campaign, which uh, originated inside Myanmar, and it's um, it's a it's a campaign and movement of, of 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 people in Myanmar again going after the Burmese military's business interests and their biggest sources of revenue. And the biggest sources of revenue are oil and gas revenues. Um, it's precious gems, particularly rubies and jade. They're deeply involved in that, in that trade. Um, and, uh, and to a certain extent also timber, you know, we're, we're tracking uh, uh, teak imports, which are still getting into uh, the US, even though they, uh, they should be banned. Oh, no. And it is good to see that we can actually have small victories. And when we look at the statistics, I mean, it's a year after the Burmese military overthrowing the democratic elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. Those horrifying statistics of death, torture, detention, and disappearance of civilians, they really are mounting high. According to many, there's at least 1,500 civilians that have been killed, nearly 12,000 arrested since February 1. And when you look at what the army has done, it's really important to see what we can do and how we coordinate what's possible going forward. Yeah, and could be, what I always tell people is, you know, you have an enormous source of power, sources of power. And I say, you know, think of the, your, sources of, your sources of power as your power as a citizen to participate in political process, lobby your government. You have a lot of power as a consumer with your consumer dollars. You also have a lot of power as an investor, you know, as a, as a shareholder in a lot of these companies. And if you use these three forms of power, you can uh, affect change on, on almost any issue that you care about. Well, that's a great point. And maybe we can look also what pressures come, we've talked about from the grassroots and the ground, but what has the UN done? Looking at the UN Security Council, but also looking at sometimes when the Security Council has a block by one of the permanent five how has the Human Rights Council been another tool that you might be able to share a little bit about, about how the international arena has been putting moral and political and legal pressure on this junta? Yeah, indeed, action by the UN Security Council has been largely blocked by China and Russia, which have been um, supporters and defenders of the Myanmar military. Um, but at the Human Rights Council, I and mean, we've had a, a lot more success. And in fact, the Human Rights Council authorized um, uh, a, uh, a UN special rapporteur on Myanmar. He's currently uh, Tom Andrews, former congressman from Maine. Uh, and he's, he's very effective in using this bully pulpit to um, put a focus on the Myanmar military and ways in which the international community could put more pressure. Um, there's also um, there's also a mechanism that's doing research on uh, not just mass atrocities by the Myanmar military, but also uh, looking in, looking again into the Myanmar military's business interests and how they're getting the money to pay for the weapons that they use to carry out these abuses. And so, you know, there's a, there's a very good. Um, organization that operates underground inside Myanmar called Justice for Myanmar. And you can find them at justiceformyanmar.org. Uh, and they've done amazing research 
on the Myanmar military and particularly its business interests and sources of revenue and sources of money. Um, and uh, that's a group that we work with very closely, taking their research, you know, which highlights specific foreign corporations that are assisting the Myanmar military. And then we create campaigns that put pressure on those companies, again, through consumer pressure, shareholder pressure, media pressure, and also calling on governments to impose sanctions to end uh, the ability of those companies to do business with the military. No, it's always been that partnership. It, I never forget where we weren't allowed to go inside. You have to organize really in northern Thailand and assist people across the border so they could then be brave and bold and go back in. And then there was that little window when we could actually visit, go in, do some human rights training with the people on the ground and the indigenous peoples from all over Myanmar coming together. And now, though, it seems in recent months, the Myanmar military has actually attacked civilians and large scale operations from the Chin state in the northwest to the Kareni state in the southeast. And these tactics really are ominously reminiscent of the armed actions and the genocidal attacks against the Rohingya in 2016 and 2017. Can you share a latest on that, but also the common strategy that this military is still continuing about genocide from the Rohingya to today? I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, what we're seeing, what we're seeing uh, in Burma, not just against the uh, indigenous ethnic minorities, but also being used against the majority Burmans in the central of the country. We're seeing a lot of the same tactics that were used against the Rohingya in, uh, in August of 2017, when the Burmese army drove over 700,000 Rohingya uh, to seek refuge in Bangladesh, where they still remain. Uh, they're one of the largest refugee populations uh, in the world today. In fact, there are more Rohingya living in Bangladesh than are living in Burma right now. Um, but you know, I think what we've seen is that um, the military has united the country perversely. They have um, by 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 using now using these tactics in you know central Burman cities like Mandalay and Rangoon, they are they've demonstrated to the majority uh, Burmans that uh, yes this is a this is a military that will use any tactics you know this is a military that will that will um you know employ uh genocide and and, and crimes against humanity against uh, all peoples in burma um and um and that's resulted in uh a lot of uh new alliances forming up where um you know you, you see Ethnic Burmans, you know, who had been in the, the been in the the ruling National League for Democracy in uh, you know between 2015 and 2021, come out and say, "Oh, you know, we were wrong about supporting the military's tactics against the Rohingya," and you know now the the National Unity Government, which is made up of of which is actually a multi-ethnic uh, government made up of elected officials and other 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 uh, civil society leaders is now saying very clearly that um, that uh, the Rohingya um, should be should be granted full citizenship in Burma, which they're currently lacking. And they've even gone so far to go to the International Court of Justice. This happened. Uh, I just heard about this today. National Unity government has said to the said officially in a public letter to the um, International Court of Justice that. You know, it is the legitimate government of Burma, not the not the the military hunter, and um, it will represent Myanmar in these proceedings at the International Court of Justice, where where they are considering the charges of genocide of the Rohingya against the Myanmar military, and they've said we 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 uh, we formally um, take away any objections we have to the process here. You know, this process should go forward. Uh, that happened actually, I mean, we just saw that, I saw the statement today. I mean, that, that is how far things have moved. And that, that's very encouraging. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I've been moved to tears when I've seen, you know, Rohingya refugees in uh, refugee camps in Bangladesh, sharing pictures of themselves, raising their three fingers of support uh, in solidarity with the, the civil disobedience movement inside Myanmar. Um, it's, and I've seen, I've seen, uh, yeah, I've seen demonstrators, civil disobedience movement demonstrators in Burma 
you know, holding up signs in support of the Rohingya. It's, it's very encouraging. Yeah, no, the spirit of solidarity has definitely been something that people have been hoping for. And I agree with your analysis that's united people. And thanks also for bringing up the International Court of Justice in The Hague and looking at those mechanisms to actually enforce justice and accountability. The other aspect before we get to ASEAN maybe is also the UN Nations Special Envoy, Nolene Heiser. How do you think she's been doing and, and what are some steps going forward as well as anything else uh, happening in The Hague that you'd like to share? Well, I'm I'm very intrigued to see what will happen at the Hague because the you know at the United Nations General Assembly, the the represent the Myanmar representative, um, Myanmar representative you know after the coup announced that you know he was you know he was a uh, a member of Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League of Democracy, and again he he spoke at the United Nations General Assembly again, raised his three fingers and said that he was, um, he was, uh, uh, you know, you know, working under the national unity government of Myanmar. Uh, and the United Nations General Assembly has not recognized a, a military junta replacement for him. So he is still currently representing Myanmar at the United Nations. Uh, uh, and what, uh, what the National Unity Government said to the, the ICJ was, you know, well, the United Nations is still recognizing, yeah. <laughs> still recognizing, you know, officials of the previous government. You know, we, we include officials of the previous government and uh, you should follow the United Nations lead on this and recognize us as the, as the representatives of Myanmar at the International Court of Justice. Yeah, that's definitely a diplomatic victory when you know a lot of the countries were trying to actually move beyond the representative, but he was very firm, he was very strong, and it's great to see him still there in that seat. Also looking at ASEAN, how has the ASEAN functioned? What do you think where we're at? And is there any actions by the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights that you believe has been most effective? Well, ASEAN's been, you know, has been helpful in some ways. I mean, they, they, they refuse to let a military junta representative um, uh, uh, be present at ASEAN meetings. And so, but, and, you know, there are some countries in ASEAN, particularly like Malaysia and Indonesia, that have been um, much more critical of Myanmar, particularly, particularly over their treatment of the Rohingya. Um, there are, you know, there are, you know, there are countries in ASEAN like Thailand and Cambodia who are, uh, uh, much more on the side of the generals uh, than uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. So, you know, ASEAN is a bit of a mix. You know, ASEAN has laid down a roadmap for the, uh, the military junta to, uh, to restore democracy, which the military continually drags their feet on and, and fails to adhere to. So, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, ASEAN is a little bit of a mess, but they are, they are engaged. Um, and they're not giving the military everything that it wants. And so that's a good thing. Excellent. And as we're getting to our final five minutes, I think what's important that we can do here in Hawaii, what can we do to assist, to put moral and political pressure on this junta so that we could see a victory beyond the corporations, making sure that business and human rights is actually happening, but actually see the people be restored to their rightful place. What are some things that's going on now that we can get involved in? Well, again, I, I highly recommend people go to uh, rohingyacampaign.org and also uh, our broader campaign uh, called uh, No Business with Genocide, which you can find at nobusinesswithgenocide.org. Um, and on both those websites, you'll find actions that you can take. One, to you know, lobby your government. I mean, we right now we're um, building up support in Congress for the, the Burma Act of 2021, which would put sanctions on the military and would provide assistance to the civil disobedience movement. And also, you know, provide support for these international accountability mechanisms like the International Court of Justice. Um, that is currently in the House and the Senate. Um, we would love to have, we currently have uh, Congressman Ed Case as a sponsor of the House 
Act of 2021. We'd love to have you two senators and your remaining representatives sign on as well. So that would be a great thing to do. And again, you can go on, go on our website and you can find an action where you can simply put in your address and it sends uh, messages to both of your senators and your representatives. So check that out. Also, we've got all kinds of campaigns where you can put direct pressure on companies. One thing we, uh, you know, one thing we're very successful with with both Chevron and Total was um, again organizing consumer pressure, shareholder pressure, and social media pressure. You know, we we not only got people to sign a petition to these companies, but when people do sign the petition, we send them an email um, to thank them and uh, having links to all of these companies' social media accounts. So you can post protests on their Facebook page, on their LinkedIn page, on their Instagram. Uh, and that's very effective. When Total said they were withdrawing, they said that they, they couldn't um, meet the expectations of their shareholders and uh, international and uh, Myanmar NGOs. And that, that's who we are. Uh, so Total is basically saying, you got us, <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't withstand the pressure that you've organized. And, you know, I said, if we can get major oil companies like Chevron and Total out of Burma through our pressure, um, there's very little that we can't achieve when we work together. That's a great point. And really, you do show how those Gene Sharp 197 nonviolent methods can really motivate and mobilize a movement for the people inside and really bringing the people together. And I think that's one feature that's so important about your advocacy is connect the people on the ground who are the most brave, who are standing there in the face of bullets and snipers with people to be able to come together. And I think what's important is we can reach out, contact Senator Schatz, contact Senator Hirono, as well as our remaining representative, Kakahele, to say, we care about democracy, we care about human rights, we care about fundamental freedoms. And that's who we should be. And that's the voice of the people that we should be in solidarity with. Simon, thank you so much for joining us. Any final words of what should be looked at in this one year anniversary and how we can advocate even better? Well, again, um, I highly recommend you to go to our websites, take our actions. When you take our actions, you'll be added to our email list. And then you'll get an email every week with an action you can take, whether it's lobbying in members of Congress, whether it's uh, um, putting pressure on a specific company. So, you know, if, if, you, if you feel moved to uh, help people in Myanmar and to stand in solidarity with them, take the actions, get on our list. It's now close to 300,000 people worldwide with about 100,000 inside Myanmar. Uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big grassroots alliance and we'd welcome as many people to join. Thank you so much. Uh, it is great to see you, and we hope next year we'll actually be talking about the reform movements and how the government is actually implementing human rights and taking care of its people with significant social structural change that unfortunately isn't there today, but a lot of work done in just one year. Thank you so much, Simon. Aloha. Thank you. 